Hello there. I wanted to um, talk about um, another person I met and actually had an interesting conversation with, and that's uh, Paul McCready, who um, won the Kramer Prize for making a paddle aircraft, man-powered aircraft that flew a figure eight around some pylons and subsequently a, another aircraft um, flew across the English Channel for another prize. And I had the opportunity of meeting um, uh, Dr. McCready up at Stevens Institute up in Hoboken uh, where he was um, addressing a graduation class up there and uh, I happened to be there. My um, my uncle was the uncle, uh, Dr. Uh, Louis Pallara was the provost up there and he is, well, he's my uncle, uh, brother of my, um, my mother, Violetta DuPont, and my mother took me up there. And we listened to the ceremony and how he addressed the class. And he essentially told the uh, class members that he, he really didn't do what he did for the, the fame of it. He did it ultimately for the money. And at the time, uh, E.I. DuPont tried to um, screw them out of the money uh, initially before they actually got started this thing in that um, they had given of course McCready uh, Mylar and things to help them do this um, but apparently DuPont wanted the, either some or all of the prize money I don't know it specifically but he told DuPont that they're gonna get enough if he was successful that they're gonna get enough uh, PR out of this to really make it worth their while and um, ultimately he did this great accomplishment um, because he knew he could do it and he wanted the money for his efforts nothing wrong with that what's interesting I had followed this whole man flight man powered flight thing since God from the very beginning when I was it's hard to say when I was maybe, you know, 10, 11 years old, people have been trying this. I mean, people have been trying this since um, Leonardo da Vinci, okay? Flapping wings, doing all kinds of stuff. Jumping off of bridges with flapping wings, trying to, trying to fly. And it seemed that the most logical way to undertake this, um, this, uh, feet and to get the uh, prize money, I think it was done, I think uh, it was British money, I believe, uh, was to ultimately make a super light, high efficiency glider, similar to the super efficiency gliders that you've seen before, but make it, make it even bigger and have lower wing loading. Um, so it didn't take that much speed to make them fly. And so consequently, uh, all of the contenders for this prize went to great extents, great, great extremes to make super smooth, super streamlined, super lightweight models. Now, or airplanes, I should say, they were pedal power. And um, some had, I think some had one, two people in them. I, 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 think, I think there was no limit to how many people you could have in these things, as I recall, but I saw models where they had at least two people in them. And um, what was interesting about this is that the um, there were some limited successes that these they would take off and fly 100 feet, 200 feet straight. But the prize required the airplane, um, the man-powered airplane to fly a figure eight around some pylons, so which, mean, which meant the airplane had to ultimately bank and the tired of the bank it could make, obviously the shorter distance it could turn around and come back. Um, I forget the distance of the pylons, maybe they're a quarter mile uh, apart from each other, half mile, something like that. It wasn't any great distance, but the fact of the matter is that the plane had to turn and I think that was the problem. Now when you're talking something with low wing loading, um, they're very susceptible to gusts. They're very susceptible um, to air disturbances. 
and they're also very fragile so when they break um, they'll break up pretty good and to repair the damage of such a lightweight craft is really difficult and I remember people actually mortgaging their homes to raise the funds to you know to build this super glider only to have them make one flight two flights or whatever and have the thing break and that was the end of it they ran out of funds they couldn't do it well uh, McCready took a totally um, different approach and he realized that, that at the speeds he was flying at that that drag was really not an issue and that weight was the biggest issue so he made essentially a big hang glider uh, with aluminum tubes and mylar wrapped around some sort of crude airfoils um, had a big prop very efficient and they had a, a bicyclist in there and they even put ice on top of their head to, uh, to cool the guy off and also as the ice melted to supply um, the pilot with water that he would need to do this and this was ex especially um, important on the um, on going across the English Channel. So essentially um, this concept of a massive wing super lightweight using wires and bracing uh, almost like a World War I airplane won the day uh, because basically if they did get a fender bender and, and crash this thing on learning how to fly it it was no big deal within a couple hours they were up and running again what they did with the aluminum tubes they actually put acid on the inside of the tube for various lengths of time so they could actually dissolve away um, the wall thickness on the inside increase the ID of the inside so they could lessen the weight of these tubes so whereas near the base of the plane or near the near the fuselage these tubes were thicker and as they moved out to the very end of the plane they were somewhat thinner and thus they're able to very economically um, machine out so to speak quote unquote uh, the aluminum on the inside of the tube using acids or caustics or whatever but it worked and they were the first to get the uh, Kramer prize which was a figure eight the second prize was to come up with a a plane that would go across the English Channel which is 20 some odd miles I believe for this they hired a, well actually it was the same guy he was a he was a professional um, bicycle racer and so he, he knew how to exert himself for long periods of time um, compared to the English English um, Channel crossing the figure it was a lot more simple um, and they did do the English Channel run they, um, they it got so turbulent and it was took so much energy for this thing to fly across the English Channel that the guy radioed in that I think his name was Brian something or something Brian um, that he um, was gonna land the damn thing he couldn't make it across the English Channel so they got the boats under and he started settling down getting closer and closer to the water and as he got closer and closer to the water the efficiency of the aircraft um, took hold and that's the ground effect the ground effect they discovered it with bombers and stuff that when they lost engines and they were just ready to ditch they found that the closer they got to the water the less horsepower they needed to stay in the air so the um, bicycle racer driver pilot um, felt that he could maintain this pace of keeping this thing up the air if he just skimmed over the waves now the problem with this was that they had boats crossing coming up and down the English Channel and they didn't want to run into a freighter or something but ultimately they uh, they made the flight and they collected the money and uh, as a result of that he was addressing the uh, class at Stevens Institute which is, which is a very prestigious historical uh, university on the Hudson where they did a lot of work I remember as a kid uh, getting tours up there and actually seeing some sort of reactor I remember looking into some water and seeing something glowing down below um, like I said, it was it was really a wonderful thing to be able to hang out up there as um, as when I was a um, freshman in high school, which was a disaster. I went to Stevens Academy, which focused on Latin and all kinds of English courses and stuff, and and um, 
uh, they really didn't focus on the sciences um, and it was a very rough grind to um, make commute in there but I thank my parents for getting me the opportunity my uncle who probably pulled some strings but anyhow here I was up at Stevens uh, Institute now and they're having a little luncheon for him after the um, graduation and no one was around him he was sitting there all alone eating his little snack or from you know the cafeteria whatever the meal was I forget what it was it was nothing elaborate and you know being a fellow pilot I uh, asked if I could um, sit down and chat with him he said sure so we're talking he's and when he's telling me more about the flight of this uh, unit and then he said that he was working with um, General Motors he was working on a pedal car type they call it human assisted vehicles or something and he had an appointment with them I guess in the next couple of days and I said well you know considering your track record I said you know at least you have a lot of credibility you've you know, been able to deliver the goods on uh, various projects and I'll never forget what he said to me he said yeah, he said, a lot of people think I'm hot stuff. And uh, he was hot stuff. He, um, he did something that no one else could do that they had dreamed of doing for thousands of years. And, um, is, and the reason why he was successful is that he was able to think out of the box. He was able to think out of the box and approach a problem from a totally different uh, point of view from a totally different direction uh, taking a whole quantum leap not in high technology but in understanding the basics of the actual problem and not overcompensating and not overcomplicating uh, a solution to that problem and as a result uh, he won the Kramer pride and that's how I got to meet um, the gentleman who did that, uh, Paul, Dr. Paul McCready. It, uh, the plane was so efficient that uh, he even, as a, as a middle-aged guy at the time, I guess, he was able to fly it and get it to fly it off the ground. So was his son. Um, more or less anybody with any type of physical capability could take this plane and, and fly it for, you know, a couple hundred feet. But like I said, they had a even had an ultrasonic altimeter that, that measured the, the distance using ultrasonics, a small transistor circuit, um, as to how high you were off the ground. Gave him a digital readout, I guess. And then he also had the, um, the water source for the, um, for the pilot, which became a big issue in the, um, the crossing of the English Channel. I imagine it took at least an hour to get across, maybe an hour and a half. I don't, I don't remember the specifics, but the uh, specifics cat just uh, triggered this thing off. So that's the story of McCready, Paul McCready, and I was happy to share it with you. Take care.